when we think about political violence, our minds, um, or at least my mind, often turns instinctively to things like terrorism or insurgencies or civil wars. But as Christian Davenport and Ben Apple write in their new book, The Death and Life of State Repression, the greatest amount of damage done to humankind has been done to people by their own governments. And we only have to look at the headlines to be reminded that that's true, that the greatest purveyor of violence and coercion in the world are often governments acting against their own citizens. Christian and Ben are here to talk with us today about their new book, which is a groundbreaking study of state repression that upends uh, some of the conventional thinking about how to stop it. Christian is the world's uh, leading scholar of state repression. And he's professor of political science at the University of Michigan and a research professor at Peace Research Institute, Oslo. He is the author of many books and articles uh, and has received many awards. Uh, he has also co-authored with Derek Ritter two installations of a graphic novel about Rwanda. And he has been described uh, by Rachel Kleinfeld as one of the world's deepest thinkers on political violence. Ben Apple is associate professor at the School of Global Policy and Strategy at UC San Diego. And his research looks at the effectiveness uh, of intergovernmental organizations, including uh, work done on the International Criminal Court and its impact on human rights and on the role of the UN Security Council in resolving wars. So Christian and Ben, uh, welcome to Talking Policy. Thank you. Thank you. So your new book is a, a deep and wide academic study of state repression that aims to fundamentally change the way we think about uh, state repression and how to stop it. Um, I think the book is a really big deal in terms of how comprehensive it is. You know, it looks at 250 examples of state repression between 1976 and 2006. Uh, you're focusing on large scale, severe repression. So the, the worst, you know, most savage, violent kinds of repression. Um, and you don't just look at kind of one policy that's thought to stop repression or influence repression. You, you really look at everything. So this is an ambitious undertaking. And you start the book by telling the story of uh, the government-backed campaign of violence in the Darfur region of Sudan, which started in 2003 and, and led to the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and the atrocities in Darfur uh, drew significant international attention. You know, celebrities organized fundraisers around it. Um, the UN sent in peacekeepers. The ICC uh, opened investigations into charges of genocide and war crimes. And reading that bit of your book um, in the introduction, a lot of memories flooded in for me because um, I was part of that tide that this is back when I was living in Washington, DC. Um, I was one of those people who cared a lot about Darfur at the time, and uh, and I went to events and I read books. Um, so I think we can, some of us can relate to that memory of like, oh, that's right, that was like a huge thing for a while globally. But that huge swell of support of of um, you know political attention at the international level of of money of time to try to stop the violence uh, and the didn't stop it. And this is part of what your book is, is all about. And so it's a really compelling introduction. Christian, you're a veteran, obviously, in the academic space on state repression. This has been one of uh, the areas that you've focused on for a long time. Um, and Ben, post-conflict you know, justice and how to stop violence against civilians, also a central for focus in your career. So I wanna start by asking you guys, why did you decide to write this book now, Christian, I'll start with you. Yeah, I was I was probably gonna jump in. I was gonna jump up first. Um, I guess my 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 immediate kind of response would be like, it's not for now. It was for then, now, and later. I mean, like, um, the book emerged from this kind of coevolution of Ben and myself of kind of the field, the field of political repression, state repression, human rights violation has been kind of stuck for for now a couple of decades. I mean, it's 
it's very much a kind of sociology of knowledge issue. First, we were working on conceptualization. Then we were working on kind of like, okay, what might work and how are we thinking about it? And then things kind of exploded. So like everyone has got their kind of like variable or policy du jour. It's like the thing that they believe in, the thing that they advocate for, and then kind of give short shrift to others. And so one of the reasons that, that Ben and I partner was because you know, we kind of believed that different variables, my, policies might matter and that we could better cover all of them if we were together as opposed to individually. And so I think in many, res in many respects, the book emerged out of our awareness of just kind of the state of knowledge. And this sociology of knowledge bit was really important because you start talking not to like go after people, but if you talk to like Catherine Sicking or Beth, Beth Simmons, they'll lead you in a particular direction because they believe in particular variables and almost the whole field is arrayed like this. And so and when you say variables, like, are you talking about policy, like, sorry. like international naming uh, and shaming military yeah. intervention? Yeah. So like, you know, there's, there's like, there's the variable, there's the policy, and then there's yeah. the advocates of that particular policy and the scholars that advocate for a particular variable. Um, and so I think our intervention is very, very much, we were led to comprehensiveness because we re realized how fragmented, and soloed, siloed these different kind of like um, folks were, and that the way to overcome that was to try to address it as comprehensively and thoroughly as possible. I think in many respects, in many respects, we went we went back to we went back to ground. We were just like, okay, let's let's what's worth doing? What do we need to know in order to do that thing? And I think what's worth doing is how does how does one stop this phenomena? I think is kind of really how we jumped in. Um, and then kind of evolve from that point. But um, Ben? Yeah, no, I largely agree with that. Um, we are kind of boxed off, right, in our different silos and our different kind of concepts. For me, I, I typically have focused on international law, the ICC, as you mentioned. Um, so we did want to take a more holistic approach to really kind of compare and contrast these different policies that have been put out there by different scholars and activists and so forth. Um, but I would say in addition to that, kind of crucial touch this at the very end, is focusing on just rethinking state repression, right? Everyone did it the same way, the same data, the same thinking behind it, but like, we're like, wait a second, like state repression varies across this continuum. And maybe we want to focus on the worst cases, because that's what people really often care about. Like the atrocities, you know, you name the country, right? North Korea, China, Russia, right? Iran, um, the worst case scenarios, okay? That's one thing. And then two, really, really the rethinking in terms of um, conceptually and these different parts of it, Christian, like the life cycle of repression. Um, and so we just thought some of the independent variables, the concepts needed to be kind of refreshed and updated and compared and contrast, but also understanding the outcome itself, repression, we thought also needed to be a bit uh, refreshed. And that's how we kind of, we started, as Christian said, with termination, right? Because we just thought, how do we end these terrible situations? That was like our introduction to this. And then it kind of expanded to the other parts of the life cycle in the book. Mm -hmm. Um. One thing I, I wanted to ask, and you've you've answered this um, a bit through your answer to the previous question, is how do, how do you differentiate this work from past work, um, in part to help listeners understand kind of why this this contribution is your book is so important and valuable, and and you uh, and you mentioned that you know you're you're looking at all the variables, all the potential vari variables that can influence repression both at kind of the international factors that we've talked about naming and shaming and sanctions, but also the domestic factors. So not just one piece, but everything together that you're looking at the large scale repression and that you're examining it as a process and not some kind of isolated event. I was, I was surprised reading the introduction um, given that state repression is, as you said, such a huge force of violence in the world. Um, that it seems to, and tell me if this is accurate, that it seems to have received comparatively less attention from social scientists than like terrorism or revolutions. Um, like, is this an understudied area? And, and like, why would that be the case? So, may I, Jack, Ben? Yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, like uh, it, it's funny you say that, right? Because you, 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 you started off with, when I think of political violence, I think of, and I'm just yeah. like, why do you think you have that orientation? Yeah. It's just like, so, Gov First off, governments fund scholarship. Governments facilitate access to information. Governments would like you to help them resolve their problems. And thus, that's why, you know, Minerva will never give out grants 
um, or DOD will never give out money to help understand why states are engaging in violent behavior. Why, why would they want to study themselves? I'm like, that's, that's not what they do. So we end up having more information, more resources, more understanding of these other types of phenomena. And this is the, this is like the big thing that like folks don't wish to talk about. And it's just like, if you look at, you mentioned civil war, which does involve governments, but even, even in that, that literature, the problem or the insurgents, it's like, if they just stood, if they just took, if they just understood their place, there'd be no problem otherwise. But it's like, um, it's really this issue of um, all the challenging behaviors. We know much more about, they're much more developed. And so relatively speaking, we now, we know much less about repression because it's been historically less attention given to it. Now, what we know now in 2022, compared to like the late eighties, it's like, there's hundreds of people doing repression and human rights stuff now. There was like a handful of us in the, in the at that particular time period, right? Getting historical. Um, but you could look to the civil war crowd, which was the group that I was most aware of at the time and the interstate war people, there was a big group that was involved in that. Um, that trajectory of scholarship as well. So I could see what was going on in those areas, but the repression area, there was very few folks that were doing it. And so over time, it's just like, you know, we have, it's grown, but relative to the, I mean, post 9-11, you know, the, the field of terrorism went from like, you know, a dozen people to many dozens. Civil War literature over the 90s also exploded, right? So a tremendous amount of attention, but most of that literature is focused on the insurgent problem. Yeah. And so um, these habits of thought really kind of return in many ways to kind of like reveal exactly what we do or do not know. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. It, you know, kind of hits too close to home, right? You know, who are the, you know, we're studying ourselves bad things that we do at times, which is difficult, I think, for governments. They're not going to obviously, as Christian said, support that or fund that. Uh, um, it's easy to kind of pick out the bad guy as you're talking about terrorism or, or insurgency or kind of Cold War rivalries. You can you see it. It's, it's, it's accepted by all. Um, so, yeah, I think that that's a big part of it. And, and also, it's also hard to study, right? Like governments are incentivized to hide their repression, right? It's just it's hard to know who you're torturing, hard to know yeah. who you're politically putting in prison, right? Hard disappearances by definition, right, are difficult to uh, if not impossible to identify. And so it, it is just beyond the political aspect of it, I think a difficult uh, type of violence to actually seriously engage in. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's it's funny, right? I, I rarely make some of these connections, but um, I don't think it's I don't think it's bizarre to have some Africans, Americans and, and some and some Jewish people and some people, uh, Palestinians, folks that have suffered from state repression studying this particular topic. Um, I think it's I mean, I felt more than comfortable accepting that, yes, the U.S. government engaged in violent behavior being an African-American. I felt very comfortable going, OK, yeah, you know what? They can engage in human rights violations, too. And then that kind of like feeds you into that area and like, oh, other people are suffering as well. Oh, let us look at how they're suffering. And, you know, so that I think um, I think there's something to be said about who's going into what silo. Right. Who's going into what field of uh, research? Yeah. So what can you say what what is state repression i was thinking about this and i was talking to my husband about the interview last night um state repression isn't like the language that folks outside the academy would probably use people might think about human rights violations um but can you give put some you know examples to this like when what is the book about in terms of what is what is state repression what are some examples um and like why do governments do it Yeah, uh, I'll let you take the lead, and I'll. Let me start. Uh, so, um, yeah. so, so we don't use this. We don't use this language, right, in in the book. But um, I'm feeling I'm feeling more in line with moving in this direction. Um, I view it as it's a weapon of the weakest. I mean, we're we're told, you know, we're told use your words. We're told <laughs> that you know bull bullies use coercion and force, and um, and this gets back to the power debate. So this, there's so many things that kind of Aaron, 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 Aaron talked about this as well. So I view it kind of like it's a power attempt um, directed by political authorities against the body politic, literally human bodies, and in an attempt to alter their behavior or ideas or those of the viewing audience. But it's because, in part, because they have nothing else that they're able to do effectively. It, so that's why it's, it's just a weapon of the weakest. And so it's coercive and forceful, it's directed against the body, it's undertaken by political authorities. 
Um, and I think that kind of gets us there. But as you identify, state repression is like, that's what a, that's a label that folks would use kind of like that are challenging political authorities, like you associated with like maybe the political left or people coming out of, you know, Central Latin America that were suffering all types of atrocities from state sponsored behavior, many US back by the way. Mm -hmm. um, and so the human rights violation language emerges as something kind of like a little bit more neutral, but I think that's somewhat problematic um, in the sense that it gets you away from this political domination aspect mm -hmm. of it. And I think the ideology of the phrase state repression, political repression, government repression emerges from this mm -hmm. distinct literature that was trying to look at, um, you had some people in power and they were trying to keep it. How are they using it? Um, well, they were engaging in this thing against these people below them. Uh, the human rights violation literature, it was more legalistic. It's like, these are the things the government should avoid. I'm like, according to what? I'm like, okay, so there's different traditions that kind of capture the different labels, but there was political domination, social political control. There's so many labels that were, that were out there for it. Um, and I kind of, I kind of like state repression. Ben was kind of cool with using it, but he does have a kind of human rights violation kind of take some time to, not to speak for my co-author and good friend but um, um we we'd kind of i think we settled on language fairly fairly um fairly early and that's that was helpful but clearly there's some signaling going on with regards to some of the language that folks use including us mm -hmm. yeah i think that's right um you know quick definition right large scale violent activity by the government directed at its own people right so it's got to be by the government or its agents directed at its own people typically understood as within its own territorial jurisdiction right mm -hmm. like if it's in an interstate war that's usually a different kind of kind of concept uh, um and lots of things can constitute that right it could be torture it could be the disappearances it could be political imprisonment uh, uh you know just excessive use of force against protesters it's, it's, it's obviously very fairly common uh, um you know, one thing we talked about, it's happening right all over the world. That's the thing, despite the fact that very few people talk about it, right? If you actually look at the basic trends, still like a majority of countries engage in some level state repression, even 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 today. So mm -hmm. so it, it is in fact a very, I would say, you know, important policy area that, uh, that doesn't quite get, get, the, get the attention it deserves. Yeah. What's fascinating, what's fascinating in many respects, it, going back to kind of Ben's comments, it is this kind of ubiquitous commonplace thing. Everyone knows what the concept is, right? It's it's civilians getting pulled out of their houses for some political reason to then be tortured and disappeared in Guatemala or Gitmo. We know what this is. It's mm -hmm. protesters getting beat up on the street for BLM. It's John, you know, for, you know, the, the the late great John Lewis and company on Pettus Bridge getting their asses handed to them. I mean, like, you know, everyone has an idea of what it is. Mm -hmm. Now, what drives it, how it's related to other forms of violence, they don't know this. But mm -hmm. it's amazing. It's like it's like the thing that people are most aware of, but don't understand. And so mm -hmm. this is one of the kind of like frustrating elements of studying the topic, right? It's like, everyone's kind of familiar with it and not yeah. many people like it, but they're kind of like, well, I don't know what to do about it. And so they kind of like, you know, stop it at that point. But. Yeah, yeah. Uh, people who study other kinds of political violence um, often think about it in a similar to way, uh, in a similar uh, way that you do in the book, which is to think about it as a cycle and a process. Um, and I'm, I'm curious why, um, why state repression or how state repression is distinct from like civil war? Um, like how is it unique as a form of political violence? I mean, there's a variety of ways, you know, I think the, at the most basic level, civil war is two-sided, right? Where state repression is typically more one-sided government is repressing, committing violence against its own people. Um, civil war, right, has to have a formed you know, that has to have non-state actor involved, right? Like a rebel group or, 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 or soon to be rebel group that's fighting the government. So I would say the two-sided versus one-sided is to me at least the biggest difference. I mean, the way people study civil war, there's like battle death thresholds and stuff like that, which gets into more, I guess, I don't know, um, technical aspects of or repression. If you, you know, if you killed one person, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna think about it. We're gonna talk about it and try to understand it. Um, that's how I view it. They're certainly related, right? We know repression often leads to civil war and repression is very common in the context of civil war, but again, I would view it as, view it as something very distinct in civil war. Yeah, I, I would guess I would highlight the civil wars are rare, right? So it's like let's not let's not get carried away. Whereas repressions happen most of the time, hmm. so it's kind yeah. of like you know that's why it's kind of interesting where folks yeah yeah end up paying attention to this like isolated thing and miss this other thing. And I'm just kind of like, and it's not as if the government one sided version of this is less lethal. I mean, like 
Um, there's no one who would be like, yeah, the Holocaust wasn't that violent. It was like, mm -hmm. you know, of, of course. No, you know, there's no one going to say that, you know, um, that the repression that took place in the Soviet Union after the revolution is not that. No, no, everyone will kind of admit that. So clearly there's some there's some kind of conceptual overlaps. This happens first, this happens later. But mm -hmm. I'd say most of the time we're in situations where there's repression. And that's one of the, the most sad things about being in this particular area that, you know, these, these, I mean, I, I lost friends in 9-11. I mean, like it, it, the terrorist activities were horrible, but I'm just kind of like going, all right. So a bunch of people start studying terrorism at that point. Mm -hmm. What happens to all the governments? It's like, okay, so the governments had clearance in many respects because the people who would normally intervene for some humanitarian reason are now concerned with terrorists and other types of challengers. And what impact does that have on like state activity on a more mundane level to go after people that they wish to go after? Mm -hmm. And so those types of questions kind of get obscured by these, you know, distinct foci. Right? Mm -hmm. So going back to the case of Sudan and Darfur, um, all of, as we already talked about, all of the international efforts to try to stop the killing there, um, uh, as that case shows in it, what you find in your book, looking across all kinds of examples, the sort of go-to interventions that the international community has for stopping state repression, so economic sanctions, uh, military intervention, the naming and shaming, um, and then human rights treaties, did not work um, and don't tend to work um, across all of these cases. And in some sense, I, I thought that was like, oh, it, parts of that were counterintuitive to me, especially sanctions. And we've all been thinking about sanctions this year with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the huge marshalling of sanctions, um, you know, dramatic sanctions against Russia. And it kind of makes sense. Like, why would a government continue to do something if it's threatening their economic livelihood? Um, or why, why would they continue to do something if it's going to damage their legitimacy? So like on one level, I, I, I get it. Um, and yet you're showing that these things don't work. Um, can you talk about why they don't work um, and give us some examples? I mean, I think the quick answer is that they're too weak to, to implement, they're too, they're too weak to impact what actually matters. I mean, and so, you know, so even think of the, the Russian case, right? It's just like, okay, so is Putin's individual wealth impacted by these sanctions? I mean, because we're just presumed, I mean, yeah. GDP per capita trade, these these things are like rather large scale and multidimensional, where really what you need to get at is how much access do, does a particular elite or part of the elite have access to, and is their wealth impacted? Will be a much better measure, right? In trying to capture this. Um, but I think part of the issue, Part of the traditional setup, though, is there's a political leader out there, and that political leader is sensitive to a variety of forms of information. And then they're trying to assess what's happening out in the world, and then assessing those factors. They're just like, okay, can I survive this or no? And they're going to respond, if the belief is, they're going to respond to those things that negatively seem like they're going to impact their position. Okay, most leaders stay in power most of the time. They're not, they're not changing things like daily. And they're pretty insulated in many respects because they can counter these things. And our, our argument is, okay, you know what? There's probably some evaluation like that in the beginning. And then after that, there are folks locked down. They're dismissing information that counters their belief. They're paying attention to the people that were in the room and they're ignoring everybody else. And so it's, it's this much more insular kind of decision process as opposed to this... The, 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 the traditional argument, which is like people are op political leaders are open to what's going on in their environment. And we're like, no, they're not. They're the complete opposite. And so you need something that is going to perturb that particular kind of insular nature. And unless you can get inside that room and perturb those folks, then you're not going to have much of an impact, if any. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I completely agree with that. Um, first, I'll say, yeah, it was pretty, um, I guess, depressing when, you know, the results when, when very little international factors actually make a difference um christian i used to joke about this right my background really is the ic international criminal court international human rights treaties right economic sanctions so i believed in these institutions and i thought they would actually make a difference at least at the margins um but yeah as you just noted it turns out in these cases they just they, they are they are irrelevant in, in these cases most unfortunately how, how are all these communities responding to your book 
Well, first off, most 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 folks can function pretty well in political science without engaging in other communities. And so this this is probably going to be part of the difficulty, right, which is why we're willing to kind of talk to anybody about kind of what's going on to engage with them. But part of the issue is I think it's less that some of these folks it's less that these folks were wrong. It's it's more, I think, an issue of lumping all repression together. Um, repression that's taking place in the context of de-escalation or escalation or onset or recurrence, lumping all those different dimensions together was never going to allow you to assess any type of causal impact anyway. And so our compartmentalization allows us to actually better ascertain whether there is an, a, an effect or not. And so it's a more reasonable, we think, uh, conception and test of what was going on. And that most of the things that we think have an impact don't, okay, I'm like, you know, I, I'm more committed to I guess humanitarianism and reducing violence than I am, my variable is right. And so folks kind of, unfortunately, this is the complete opposite of how academia functions, right? You get benefits if your particular explanation or policy or variable is right. You know, you're not getting, you're not getting points really professionally for like showing that somebody else's explanations don't work and you're not offering anything. And so I think that that might be one of the reasons why, you know, one, it took us a while to finish this because different people were kind of responding to it. And, and it took us a while to realize this very fragmented and provincial conception that people had. It's like, okay, if some people who committed to naming and shaming read this, they'd be like, no, no, this can't be right. It's like, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, it, it is. It's like, okay, well, we're gonna dismiss it. Or we're not gonna pay attention to it. And so we're not getting any, we weren't getting it, we weren't getting much player support because people were viewing it this way as opposed to kind of more broad, I guess in a, um, a podcast, it doesn't help that I, I was doing that with my hands, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, you know, hopefully, hands. hopefully in transcript, he gestures narrowly. <laughs> he with gestures his narrowly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, so you guys, you call it the, the juggernaut theory that the idea that, um, the, you know, there's a, a relatively small insular group of, you know, political actors, security actors that that are kind of responsible for deciding on to, yes, we, we are going to do this, whatever this is. Um, and as you said, that they they might they might do some kind of cost benefit analysis at the beginning. Um, but once they they sort of decide on a path of violent repression, um, it, it's like this momentum that is behind it. And it is very hard to change. Um, uh, and, and so that makes me I want to ask the question, then how do you make it less desirable from the beginning, um, given how hard it is to change once it starts? Now, you talk about things that have an impact in in stopping and preventing escalation in preventing recurrence. But how right like at the beginning, how do you make it a, le a less desirable option? Like or can you because you do characterize these groups, these cohorts as totally desperate. Uh, so is there a way to sort of influence it so that they don't start in the first place? Yeah, I mean, so I think that's key. Like one of the big implications of the book is it's really difficult to end these, you know, large scale, severe, you know, repressive spells. So therefore, what should you do? Really focus in part on preventing them, right? I think that is one of the big implications. Um, and that is hard to do as well, right? Um, you know, a few things that come out of the book and then just beyond the book, right? One thing we do find an important effect for in terms of decreasing, you know, the onset of these spells is uh, trade agreements, preferential trade agreements. So mm -hmm. economic factors, economic globalization matters little, little once the spells begin, but they do have some impact to prevent a spell. So trying to incorporate, it's in the appropriate way, some of these states into the global community, economic community might, might be helpful. Um, you know, there's always the big ones that we talk about in literature, right? You know, it, so it's economic development slash trade, let's say, um, democratization, which we find obviously is important throughout the book, but really it's important, electoral democracy to prevent it, strong rule law systems, really we need those, domestic rule law systems, um, reducing the onset of civil war, because a lot of repression happens in the context of civil war, as we mentioned. Um, so those are some of the big ones we can do, mm -hmm. right, to act early on. Um to again try to prevent you know uh, these things from starting in the first place because it again, it really is difficult to stop once they start. I would add, I mean, and this is somewhat this is beyond the scope actually of kind of like where we went, but also the literature, um, kind of like the role of economic inequality, and like um, one of the one of the primary reasons why you might have forceful and coercive governance or the idea that that might be a way of resolving problems is the need, the perceived need to kind of protect 
the goodies effectively. Um, and so it might be the case that you're less likely to see that in other situations. And, you know, here, here we're, um, as Americans, we're, we're immediately caught. It's like, okay, well, who's teaching folks that the, the bullying way of governance is the way to proceed? I mean, there's a, there's a handful of nations who go around the world training other folks on what to do in terms of governance, in terms of coercion and force. And the United States is one of them. So this is another reason why we'd have like some issues and some folks might take some issue with what we're doing. But the difficulty of getting to non-coercive enforceable governments has to be influencing these folks that are coming in and training others. The US, China, Russia. It's like we need to kind of address exactly how we're how we're instructing others, how we're preparing them to deal with their citizenry. And unfortunately, coercion and force is, if you take regime change and redistribution of resources as an indicator, is pretty damn effective at keeping people subjugated. And so um, we need to kind of like shed light on this process and then ask that big question, which is kind of like, okay, so how can we, but it's, it's, it's a similar type of question to what we're asking about the police, right? How do we get the police to not engage in coercive and, and forceful behavior against ordinary citizens within their population? And this is just the, the larger version of it. How do we show or, or demonstrate or get political leaders to not move in this direction of coercive and forceful behavior against those under their jurisdiction? And this is this is this becomes an older question from like the seventies, right? Which is kind of like, there's some research that shows, it's like, okay, you know, you could respond in a variety of different ways. You could economically pay people off. You can culturally kind of like work up some kind of like um, capital or or some mechanism of why people would listen without having to go coercive or force, or you could do coercion and force. And unfortunately, we've kind of like, we as a global population have kind of like moved in the direction of coercive and forceful mm -hmm. government behavior as like the go-to solution mm -hmm. for how to, how to establish and maintain a society. And so I think something that emerges from the book is we need to, we need to re-challenge that understanding and kind of push in other directions. And there was this kind of, I think, a, a push to kind of talk about economic development. And then you had political democracy over here, but we never really kind of looked at, well, okay, if you have economic inequality, but you have development, what's that do for democracy? I mean, so those, those yeah. relationships weren't necessarily as well played out. Yeah, and it's interesting to think about the the dual and contradictory role that the U.S. has played globally in terms of, um, you know, uh, democratization efforts, which, you know, lots of billions of dollars have gone into democratization efforts on the part of the U.S., and those are, there are lots of opinions about, about those efforts. Um, and the U.S. has been a chief supporter of some of the horrible repression that you talk about in your book. You know, one of your case studies is Chile, but there are many other examples, too. Um, so the, one of the headlines, I think, of your book is that domestic factors, not international factors, um, play the biggest role in ending state repression or preventing state repression. And, and as you said, it, democracy is really kind of the thing um, that, that stands out, electoral democracy, um, independent judiciaries, um, in terms of preventing a state from initiating mass violence. Um, and you find that nonviolent resistance tends to prevent it from escalating. Um, I guess, can you can you talk us through this a little bit more? Um, and I know there's variation, you, you look at, kind of what has the biggest impact overall. And, and because your book is based on the idea of looking at repression as a process and you, you have distinct points in that process, you also look at like what is most effective at each point in the process. Um, but talk us through like why, why democracy matters and what, what exactly is happening um, like, how is democracy helping to prevent repression? On one hand, it's it feels obvious. And on the other hand, I want to know, like, what it means. And maybe you have a story that you can give as an example um, that can help us kind of wrap our head around it. Well, Christian, you, you, wanna wanna start, you wrote the book on democracy and repression. I was about to say, so do, you wanna, do you want to do the less, <laughs> the, less, the less cynical version of it? Um, and so um, I think our article, we highlight this a little bit. We highlight this a little bit more directly than we do in the book, um, because the literature would lead you to believe that political leaders, once democratized, fear the population moving against them, and thus they do the thing that they think the population will most like to experience, which is not have repression. 
Um, alternatively, democracy provides an alternative mechanism to social political control so that governments don't need to engage in coercive and forceful behavior because they can get citizens to believe in the system and that would preclude their activity. For example, and this will sound strange for a second, but but roll with me. It's like most activists that I knew upon uh, Obama's election were kind of like, we won. And I was like, maybe not. We might need to do some stuff. But they were like, let's, let's give the brother a shot. So that diffused people engaging in dissident activity, any challenging activity, because they will give them a shot, not just for four years, but for eight. And so then that cohort, that youthful cohort that was ready to engage in protests and stuff at the beginning of that time period is now aged out of their mobilization. And we're kind of like, well, that's, an, that's for the next generation because now I got a mortgage to pay. And so there's something about democracy and democratization that can serve as an alternative mechanism. Now, we don't, this is something that's kind of like, because I think what you just raised is, is a big question that emerges out, out of the book. Like, okay, well, what is it about democracy that has this impact? And we talked a little about this in the conclusion. It could be that democratic nations are in the process of democratization. You've purged the most radical individuals, so you don't need to engage in any more coercive, forceful behavior above a particular threshold because now you've basically eliminated the problem. And so I think that's like the next, that's the next thing that we kind of need to move to unpack in what that impact is to see if leaders are kind of going, well, because we're in a democracy, we need to do X as opposed to, well, we just got rid of the left left. So we can negotiate and now we can have petitions because we know what you're going to say. But that was, that's my take on it. So Ben? Yeah, no, I mean, I agree largely with that. I mean, there are different reasons why I think, you know, probably one of the more conventional ones, right, is giving people a voice. And they think they're part of the process, right, that they can vote, they can help, you know, elect leaders at different different levels. Um, so they'll be less inclined to threaten people when they're part of that process, right? You're not going to, like, undermine your own institutions, essentially. Um, especially, I think that's the case when you're first starting out, because you're going to give, you know, the benefit of the doubt to these new democratically elected leaders. We're, we're on the right path. We're doing the right thing. We're part of it now. Let's support them. Let's go along with it and see where this this can this can take us um so i would view that as probably the probably the biggest explanation for it but certainly there, there are other ones out yeah. there as well is there an a, like an emblematic example a case like a country that you can like briefly summarize that that just like tells the story really well again kind of to give listeners some like something to hold on to uh the, it's tra the, the example that comes, occurs to me, which, which will sound completely odd, and we did not do this in the book, but um, the American South, you have, you have a nonviolent direct action, which begins in the 30s, moves through the 40s, up into the 60s. You then get democratization of the South and a reduction of the most overt, the mm -hmm. largest scale forms of violence. And then you have Black electoral participation, registration, and so forth. It's not like violence ends in the South, but the large scale thing that you're thinking about. So as, mm -hmm. as the audience is trying to struggle to kind of think about this, I, I want to just bring it home and be like, look, look, look at your own, look at their own nation state and look mm -hmm. at the Southern states and look at what they were like. They were authoritarian, they were repressive in the 20s and 30s. And then there's a nonviolent direct action, which everyone's now familiar with because of uh, the national holidays, you know, the King holidays coming up again. Yes. And, and John Lewis and all these folks, there was a nonviolent direct action directed towards political democratization. We got the political democratization and then subsequently the large scale violence goes away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One thing I just want to emphasize there is the important role, uh, indirect role uh, that civil resistance plays, right? So yeah, democratization is our key finding, but we kind of take a step back throughout the book and look at what causes that, right? Because it, democratization is very hard in and of itself. It doesn't just happen out of thin air, right? It's a very hard, hard, you know, institution to accomplish. Um, so I think one of the takeaways too is, you know, what, how can we get to democratization ultimately to get to spell termination? That really is his domestic-based movements that have a lot that we find have international support to them. Um, and so that's where we see, right, you had the civil resistance movements in the South foster the political democratization that helped at least reduce uh, um, repression. But we see the other countries as well, right? So a couple of cases we talk about in the book, like Madagascar, for example, right? Authoritarian regime, yet high levels of repression, late 80s, early 90s, major protests erupted, right? The civil resistance movement, domestic dissent, 
what often happens at first, unfortunately, is that dissent is then left is then leads to more widespread repression, which is what happened there, right? So you had an escalation of repression, unfortunately, right? But the protest, you know, stay the protesters stay resolved, they stay committed, right? They kept pushing, and within a couple of years, you then had elections in that country, democratic elections actually in that country, that ultimately led again to at least a termination of, of high repression, mm-hmm. right? And Zambia was a similar story, not quite as clear cut because there was still some repression post leader change or post democratization, but you had this, you know, repression, very strong civil society movements, right? Led by students, trade unions, right? Thousands of protesters really helped to shut down that country for a period of time. Ultimately, there were some concessions made, protests continued, then they opened up elections, you had a new leader come to power, and it helped to, I guess, at least reduce repression in that case. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. It's hard. I mean, it's in some sense, it it does. Part of it boils down to people's willingness to pay a price for other people, you know, with their own risks that I can't imagine taking myself. Um, It's just, it's really hard. (laughs) Um, I want to ask about, are there current life cycles of state repression that your book sheds light on that, that we wouldn't understand that we that we can understand in a new way because of your book and i mean on my mind certainly and probably a lot of people's minds are um you know russia's invasion of ukraine which you know christian in a post that you wrote for political violence at a glance shortly after they invaded ukraine you characterized uh, one potential characterization is that that is state repression depending on how you look at it so that that's one thing that is on a lot of folks minds right now um you know, looking at these images out of China right now and the protests there and uh, China's another big question mark. Iran is another. Um, How how does your book help us understand these these instances of state repression in a new way? That's a great question, actually. Um, um, So um, in that spirit, some things that I had not thought about previously, um, the kind of like... um, the Ukrainian invasion as instance of state repression piece actually speaks to the whole dynamic of, in the context of the Russian political elite, um, one, still viewing Ukraine as being part of their, their nation, um, that makes it a spell, right? That's, that's saying we need to understand that invasion as it initially connected. It's not invasion for them, right? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a vanquishing of some domestic opponent within this territorial unit that officially eliminated or officially dissolved, but that they believe still exists. So um, rather than that being a unique instance of international invasion, it's um, a part of a continued escalation of a long enduring spell of subjugation for this particular part of the world. Um, And then if you think, uh, we talked about this earlier, but like post 9-11, it's just like, we shouldn't be evaluating repressive behavior in 2022 or 2021, as if it's got like no connection with this significant global ramp up in repressive behavior within each nation as they're trying to feel deal with their domestic terrorism or counterterrorism efforts. So the spell helped. We were then be- better able to understand exactly how repression is persisting over these the longer time periods as a function of the battle that's being done. It's like we speak of a war on terror. Okay, what does that actually come down to in individual nations around the globe? Spell and spell enhancement. And and le- greater legitimacy, greater support for the spells as um, as it relates to kind of that, because then you have different nations that are kind of speaking to one another. We'd like to subjugate these potential challengers. Can you give us some money for that? And the U.S. government kind of going, well, can you connect this with radical Islam or, or this uh, this other thing? And it's just like, yeah, we can. Well, like, okay, well, here's some resources. Go have at it. And then we're presuming that these governments are doing you know their best to kind of separate individual citizens from challengers, or basically it's a clearinghouse to get rid of all behavior challengers and you just call them terrorists. And so our book would lead us to kind of understand these these longer periods of repressive behavior and get away from paying attention. Oh, we have a new report on blah, blah, blah. It's like, Mm -hmm. no, we're not going to connect that, this current situation with these historical patterns, which which is the way folks who actually study these individual cases actually talk about them and actually write about them. It's like, um, it's like Kagami's and Rwanda is like, like my big case, right? It's like you understand re- repression or the lack thereof, the lack thereof of overt manifestations of large scale repression in Rwanda right now yeah. by looking at the earlier vanquishment of all behavioral challenges and the raising of civil society 
by Kagami and company in this nation. So the only way we can understand certain types of repressive behavior is to put it into the context of these spells that we use. Yeah. Yeah, no, I would agree with that. I think it's, you know, focusing on these spells, focusing on the continued existence of repressive apparatus, I think helps explain some of these cases, even say like Russia, for example, right? Like why was the Russian government so able to, to basically repress its own citizens that were in these anti-war demonstrations, right? They didn't have to take a step back, get the, get the repressive apparatus up and running, pay people, hire people. No, they had it already built in, right? Mm-hmm. That's part of their, their regime because they are in a repressive spell. So able to quickly clamp down on them, repress them right away, right? And basically for a period of time, you know, end these demonstrations that were at some point a threat to the regime. Mm-hmm. Same thing with Iran and China right now, right? There were some protests, obviously, in China. The Chinese authorities immediately reacted to because they have that apparatus built into their institutions right now. And that seems kind of commonsensical. But if you think about prior book, How Interested the Repression, is that every time there's a new threat, governments would have to decide to respond, not respond, to have you know, you know, mobilize the soldiers, you know, new soldiers, new, new, you know, non other other kind of government authorities, government agents, like people, pro-government militias and so forth. But no, they don't have that's not how it works, right? They have it built in, it's there. So they can quickly say, go target these people, right? And they can do it almost instantaneously because of this institution that they have uh from the spell itself. Yeah, yeah. Um I just have a couple more questions. One is your your so your study looks at repression from 1976 to 2006, as we've been discussing, and you find that democracy is a great antidote to repression. But democracy reached a peak in 2006, as we know, um, and has been declining ever since. Um, VDEM, which measures measures democracy, called 2020 the year of autocratization. Um, and it's not even, you know, new fragile democracies that are declining. It's it's liberal democracies. It's the U.S. It's the U.K. So, um, if democracy is part of the answer, a really important part of the answer, and democracy is on the decline, where does that leave us? <laughs> in a troubling state. <laughs> um, so that's right. So especially in terms of repression, right? So I've actually looked at this a little bit, and there is a correlation, right? States that are backsliding right, do tend to commit then more large scale severe repression, right? You see an uptick in repression in the U.S., right, under you know, the Trump administration. You saw it in Brazil, right? You saw it in Hungary, right, with the, with the, the repression of the civil society organizations in, in that country. Um, so you're seeing a direct relationship. They're backsliding, right? But then, you know, they further feel under threat and they go and they continue to really that state terror against, against their own people. Um, so it's a big, um, you know, I think it's a major concern right now that exists in the world. I think I would add the... Um... Um, so that the unraveling that we're seeing with backsliding leading to repression makes sense, right? But we should also pay attention to the fact that we can't lump all the democracies together given our importance of pre kind of civil resistance leading to it. So mm-hmm. we actually need to kind of differentiate the the backsliders as a function of looking at the like the robustness of civil society and civil resistance up to the democratization. And then we could look at the unraveling of, of that, see if it works in the direction as well. But mm-hmm. definitely we need to kind of like pay attention to it and it doesn't look it doesn't look as good the thing that's kind of interesting for me is you had a but you like a, a commu- was it called the community of democracies it was like a, a global group of uh, democracies that came together to kind of advocate for democracies oh yeah um, it's like you know um they where are they now and you know and and how are they counting the community of autocracies and like and like okay and now we might need to acknowledge that the united states might not be able to lead that effort of democracy and democratization because of the tarnished image that we have internationally. And so it might need to be some other actors that are stepping in to kind of say, okay, you know what? We are truly a community of democracies, not just one. And we need to have a global representation within that and try to understand what's going on. And so um, I think that is important. I think the economic kind of component to it, economic inequality as opposed to development, I think that push is going to be necessary in many respects. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think in many, I mean, we have a piece that's kind of like uh, we're, we're we're now extending the uh, the data out to 2016, and so we're furthering our analyses, and we can kind of further kind of explore these things, as well as dyads, right? So there might be particular state perpetrators that target particular w- victims that are more amenable to a change in democratization than um, than others. Um, I think that. The idea that the military might respond to political democratization in the same way that police 
will is an interesting empirical question. Mm -hmm. And so we've had nothing, we've had no ability to do that. And now we're pushing in that particular direction as yeah. well. Yeah, I, um, I think it also- oh, Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Just, just the importance then of civil resistance movements and non-governmental organizations, right? Some of the big cheerleaders of democracy like the US are backsliding, right? UK, as you noted, right? So who's gonna be there to stop it, right? And that really, really, I think some of these non-state actors um, that's a pivotal role that they play moving forward to keep democracy strong ultimately, you know, in part obviously to reduce repression. Yeah. Um, I know that, you know, for each of you, this is not like at all an academic exercise. It's it's very much part of your vocation. Um and uh I don't know. I guess I want to end with just a question about, you know, how do you what are you thinking about? I mean, you both have uh, Christian, again, you're a veteran, you've been doing this a long time. Been not quite as long, but just close. Um, I mean, this is what you guys have dedicated your lives to. Very often, you know, I have these conversations on talking policy with someone who studies something and the results are a little depressing. <laughs> and we talk about how do you deal with that in your in your personal life because it isn't just something you put it on a shelf and forget about. This is something that you care about. And I'm wondering, you know, how do you think about about this? In a sense, I mean. I go back to again Darfur, great, such a great, powerful example of when when so many people um, can be moved um, to care about something outside of their own life. Like that's important and valuable. Um, and part of what this book is saying is that that doesn't it doesn't actually help <laughs> the way that we wish that it could. Um, at least that's that's a very general. Um, finding, but I want to, but we know that it's not quite that simple. And I want to ask about how you each are living, <laughs> you know, what do you do? What, and how should, how should we think about the sort of concerned community of people that listen to a podcast like this? How should we think about how we can remain concerned um, in a way that, that, that works? Wow. Another good question. Um, so I'm, I mean, I'm driven by, um, a variety of things, but um, there was this great book called Compassion Fatigue. I, I, I think Mueller was her name. I can't, maybe Carol Mueller. I can't, I can't remember her name actually right now. But, um, but basically the premise was a problem emerges and people are more than willing to kind of focus in on it for a bit. But if the solution isn't really kind of simple and straightforward, then they, they get compassion fatigue. That is like, I really care about this thing, but I can't do anything with it. So back to Rwanda, it's like um, civil war. Yeah, I can't really do much with it. Nothing's really happened. And in fact, people kind of forgot about it. Genocide. Yeah, that's really horrible. But what do we do? Can't really do anything with it. Let forgot about it. Refugees in a camp. I got something for that. And then tremendous amounts of money were allocated. And we ended up, you know, sending money to places that were actually helping people that were that had committed, you know, mass killing. And so it wasn't the greatest of things. But in com encountering compassion and fatigue, I think there's this element of, you know, we need to we need to follow the truth wherever it happens to be, and so I think that very much describes our ten ten year effort to try to explore this particular topic, wherever wherever answers were to be found, we would explore it. We're just like, okay, what's the best measure for this particular policy or variable? We pursued that. What's the best functional form? We pursued that, and so that comprehensiveness, I think, helped us in many respects. But I think something that civil resistance turns out to be incredibly important within our, our piece. And so from that, this other element of the just living part, you know, I work with civil, civil protesters, some folks that would be, you know, under different categories, but challenging, I think, repressive behavior clearly. Um, and so I work with them to try to help and understand what's going on in terms of the complexities of what's involved rethinking the policies that they're most committed to, not the ones that might be most effective, but the ones that they're committed to, to pull them back to be like, okay, well, what's the most effective? And getting people to just ask that question and map out conceptually what they see is going on, I think has been has been very useful. But but one of the things that has like helped amidst this depression in many respects, the depress I found the findings to be somewhat depressive, but triumphant at the same time. I'm just like, if we know not to look at some stuff, then we can focus on on the things that actually might have an impact, and then one, and then figure out exactly what those mechanisms are. So, from that perspective, I I found it very um, 
it, it was disheartening that some of the things that we had believed in and people had developed institutions on weren't working, but it was heartening in the sense, if that is a word, uh, it was heartening in the sense that we were kind of like, oh, okay, now we have an idea of what we should focus in on and then try to gauge exactly what would make that much more effective. And so I didn't find the piece to be as um, <laughs> damaging to my positivity and, and general life as, as I initially thought it was going to. But, and writing through that actually helped. I was kind of like, okay, so what should someone do? And I'm like, yo, man, protest matters. Okay, mm -hmm. you know, hey, understanding that, you know, these governments need to be challenged and civil society is, is useful to focus in on. Okay, well, who could be our champion? Okay, now we start asking different questions. And so I think that kind of reinvigorated me in many ways, because initially I was like, oh, like, damn, okay, that doesn't work. Okay, but all these people think that that thing works. It's like, okay, it doesn't. All right, you know what? Meet the Buddha, kill the Buddha. Let's move on. Nothing sacred. Let's, 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 develop, let's develop something that is effective. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of where it's like, okay, that's not working. Let's leave that, leave that baggage. Let's move. And so I think that from that perspective, um, it's a, it's a recipe for moving forward, which is as opposed to kind of like, it was stultifying in many respects. You're like, damn, all that momentum, all that, all that money spent on this particular thing and it doesn't work. Yeah. I'm yeah. like, what, what should we do? It's like, guess what? You know, we have some solutions for that too. And so I came out very um, positive about it. And also Ben is a, is he's, he's a fountain of positivity. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I actually, I think that's an, a great way to characterize it, Christian. Um, it is on, on some level very depressing. Like I love a nice story. I set my, you know, first part of my career studying international law, international organizations. I believe in these institutions and I wanted a nice story that we could sell to people and tell people about it. Um, so the results didn't, didn't, didn't go that way. I was, I was disappointed at first, right? I really was, wow, this is what kind of story are we telling? It's pretty, pretty, pretty terrible. Um, then we found democracy, democratization be so important. That's great. But then at the same time, democratization is also so difficult to accomplish, right? And so I was still kind of depressed, you know. Um, but then I, I had the same thought, Christian, well, you know, a lot of bad here. But at the same time, we are providing a pathway, right? We're, we're an opportunity for others to get involved to find out where can we make a difference. We're kind of shifting the focus, we hope, from these international factors to these domestic ones, right? And so it may not be the best story, but I think it's, you know, probably more correct than other stories that are out there, right? And so we can funnel yeah. our efforts to backing domestic-based movements. That's where the action is. Right? When I always say, that, where's the action, right? The action is with domestic-based movements. And it, it makes sense, as we talk about in the book, right? Because these leaders repress because of domestic actors for the most part, right? Because they felt threatened, right? So how can we stop the repression is trying to, you know, focus on these groups that, that threaten them. And so, yeah, so one hand depressing, but other hand, it does provide some recipe for for, for making, you know, you know, for, for you know, better human rights in the world, and, yeah, and, related, and related to that, there's there's a leading there's a there's a there's um there's a meeting of African leaders coming to Washington D.C. in in December, and you're just kind of like, you know, one way we could stop this stuff, we could stop supporting leaders who are creating challenges or creating threats and engaging in large scale human rights violations and maintaining their support. We can stop putting those people in power, and those people that are in power, we could try to remove them. And it's just like, you know, some basic, some basic stuff. And we start looking about like, oh, okay, who put whom into power? Let's just look at that database. A few governments are, are behind putting a whole bunch of people into power and supporting them. What kind of money are people sending out on a daily basis, a yearly basis to Rwanda, for example? Mm -hmm. The United States is putting out a tremendous amount of money to support that particular regime. If we put up their human rights violations over time, they should have they should have been defunded a long time ago and so it's like we just need to kind of keep people's feet to the fire and identify ex bad example in a book on repression we need to keep people and keep people vigilant to kind of like maintain that human rights violations are something you should pay attention to and to the degree which we can associate that with particular leaders or cohorts of individuals because we don't want to just replace one fascist repressive individual with another one once we identify these cohorts that's the other thing that emerges from the book it's like we need to get better at cohort identification and mm -hmm. so when, when some when some general puts on a suit and becomes the next leader following the person that they um, assassinated recently, we need to know, hey, you know what, that person might have different policies because they're the same group, they're the same people. Yeah. Um, and so folks need to get a little bit better at kind of understanding, you know, who's who and like, uh, this, and this is hilarious in the, in the Rwandan context, if you map out everybody that's now currently around Kagame, they weren't there 10, 15 years ago. He's hmm. got a whole cohort of people hmm. he's hand selected and he yeah. got rid of everybody that was challenging him. 
And so we need to get better at understanding what those cohorts are and stop paying attention to just individual leaders, right? Yeah, we need yeah. to start paying attention to cohorts of individuals. And I think that's another um, major kind of thing that emerges out of the book about things we need to pay attention to. Yeah. I mean, I really like what you're saying about we have a, a really a responsibility to look out into the world and face the world as it is and not as we wish it was. Um, it reminds me a lot. I, I spent the better part of my career working in global development and, and spent part of my working life living in, in East Africa. And um, in the poverty alleviation business, everybody has the thing that they hope will work because they care deeply. And when you subject it to rigorous analysis, not everything does work. Um, and that evidence is not always welcome um, because it hurts because we want the work that we do to matter. Um, but we do have a responsibility to look out into the world as it as it is and not as we wish it was. So I ap really appreciate that contribution to the book. And it's it's really not a depressing story in the sense that what you're showing too is that repression can end. Um, and it does. Uh, and I, I like what you're saying, both of you, about it does also, I think, challenge us as Americans to to look uh, closely here at, at our own government and our own policies and history and um, current history as well. So I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate having you guys on the show. It is so uh, great to talk with you. Thank you for joining us on Talking Policy. Hope to talk to you guys again soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.